fatherhood, I was excited. I honestly wouldn't be able to to live with myself if I didn't fight for my family. Uh, you lost your son at the same time. I uh, got to change his diaper. And then after that, mm -hmm. uh, that's when I decided to, to take him off of the machine and, and held him into my arms until he took his last breath. The underlying cause for her um, death was preeclampsia. So in my heart, I believe that Demi had passed at the house when I was giving her CPR. Today is an episode you do not want to miss. We are talking about resilience and fatherhood, the healing journey, advocacy, and most importantly, how to be a beacon of light to help others through experiencing great loss. Today we have special guest Xavier De Leon, co-founder of Save a Mom, Save a Family. We thank you for joining us and don't forget to click subscribe. So many of you will be familiar with the unfortunate statistic that the United States is the worst developed nation when it comes to maternal health. We know that in the United States, we have the highest maternal mortality rate compared to any other developed nation. In 2022 alone, there were unfortunately 817 women that believed to have been passed away as a result of maternal related issues. There are hundreds of men who are fathers who are potentially losing their wives, their partner, and in some cases, also their child. And oftentimes that story doesn't really get talked about. So this evening, we have a special guest on our platform. We have Xavier De Leon, and he's going to share his story as co-founder of Save a Mom, Save a Family. Um, thank you for joining us, Xavier. I'm honored to have you on the platform because I find it to be an honor to share these stories. Um and to share what your journey has been as a father and as a founder of a nonprofit that is blazing the way for moms to improve the health care of moms. I wanted to um, kind of first go back to the beginning, um, to the time where you and Demi found out that you were expecting a child. What was that experience like for you? How did you find out? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And um allowing me to be on your show and, and allow me to tell my story. Um, so with me, me and Demi first, when we first found out we were pregnant, she had obviously missed a period and she had told me and I was just like, well, it can only mean one thing. So we went to mm -hmm. CVS to get a pregnancy test and sure enough, it was pregnant. And being, I think I was 22 at the time, being young, it, you go through the roller coaster of emotions, just like I'm sure you do for every first ex person's first experience of having a kid, um, mm -hmm. exciting, scared, nervous. Um, so that's how we had found out when we were pregnant. Mm -hmm. And after you found out that you were pregnant, um, what were your thoughts about fatherhood? Uh, fatherhood, I was excited. Um, growing up in a big family, I really got a sense of, of what family is, you know, um, having a brothers and, and a sister. Um, it was something that I knew I always wanted, even when I was younger, to get married and have a family. So when it finally came to fruition, it was kind of surreal. And and what type of father did you envision yourself being? Uh, the best one I could be. Um, I had a lot of good role models with my dad and uncles and things like mm -hmm. that. So um the father figure like my dad, you know, stern, but soft, you know, kind of a balance of everything when, when, the, depending on the situation. You had the experience of going through each trimester with her. Um, and how were you uh, starting to kind of fit into your fatherhood role, even during the pregnancy at that point? Um, at that point, it was getting a more stable job with benefits um, to take care of the family. Um, at the time we were still, well, we had an apartment, but we ended up moving back um, in with Tracy. But um, 
Tracy's just... semi mom, who yeah, sorry. some of our viewers may be familiar with. Now, I'm just reminding our viewers because Tracy's, you know, she's been our, on our platform sharing, being doing her advocacy work, so they realize that it's that um, it's it's Tracy's daughter we're talking about. Going to the appointments was some of the things that I was really trying to do. I know it's not easy, um, especially when mm -hmm. people, you know, with certain jobs or whatever you can't, but um, seeing how she was feeling, asking her how she was feeling, um, kind of keeping a, a mental note when I could of, of if she kind of just said something thinking to herself out loud of how she was feeling or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, was Demi enjoying her pregnancy? How was she feeling about the pregnancy? Yeah, so sure. Pregnancy, she didn't have any morning sickness or anything like that. So it was pretty smooth for Demi. Um, oh. Everything was really smooth up until the very end, honestly. Um, she didn't really have too many complaints until everything really started going off. So um, nothing crazy, no throwing up or anything like that. So it was pretty smooth for her. Can you take us back to when every when you became aware that something had changed? She had mentioned um, mm -hmm. kind of a, a pain in her ribs. And when she went to the doctor, they kind of said that it was nothing or whatever. So... Um, that was kind of a spike in like what's going on, but other mm -hmm. than that, everything was, uh, um, I mean, I hate to say it this way, but it was just all under the radar. Like it just, there was really no, nothing to feel too concerned about with all the doctor's appointments that we went to, we were mm -hmm. okay that everything was okay. So there was nothing really too, um, out of the ordinary for us to really be on, on eggshells because once, once the doctor said that everything was fine and the ba baby looked good, then it was like, okay, right. you can relax. And then that yeah. happened. So as, as I would think most people do, you know, you look for that reassurance and once you receive it, it kind of resolves your fears in that moment. And I think we can speak to that and everyone can relate to that on multiple levels, even right. for our own health. The um, diagnosis in the end with that affected uh, Demi or was the underlying cause, um, but not the direct cause, but the underlying cause for her um, death was preeclampsia. Um, and you, you and Tracy and the whole community have been such amazing advocates mm -hmm. to inform um, the public about preeclampsia. Um, take us to when you found out that there was something serious going on and that um, there may be a potential that Demi may not survive. I became aware of that right away, only because I was the one with her when she had a seizure in the middle of the night. Um, okay. I was the one that was uh, that called nine one one and and was the one giving her CPR. So um, during all of that, um, I truly believed in my heart that she had took her last breath when I was you know giving her CPR and 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 that. So in my heart, before we even left to get to the hospital, um, mm -hmm. I had kind of already knew. Um, and at that point, it was try to get to the baby as fast as we could. Obviously, they still try to save Debbie, but I, I, mm -hmm. I just kind of knew in my heart. Wow. Um, when did you process that? Because even listening to the story, I, I just cannot imagine having to provide CPR for my loved one um, and, and facing realistically the possibility that, that in that moment that they were leaving. Um, did you process that in that moment? When did you process what happened? Um, I think it took me some time. I don't think I really, I think it was just kind of a fight or flight reaction of going through everything. Um, mm -hmm. it seems so fast, but so slow at the same time. Um, I think just with time, I don't know how long it was, maybe a year or something like that when people would just kind of really mentioned like man not everybody can do that or um somebody had went through something similar and and you know they kind of shared the experience with me and it kind of really set the magnitude for it but i guess i don't know i i think in a way it's kind of god protecting my brain in a way of not mm -hmm. um, feeling the the this all the weight of it i mean at first obviously you feel the weight of everything but um, right. I think, yeah. yeah just and, with and some of our viewers may not realize also that 
uh, you lost your son at the same time. Um, tell us what happened with, with your son. What happened with Malachi? Uh, so Malachi, he was obviously born prematurely. He had an emergency C-section. Um, but um, in, in summary, I guess there was just complications. Um, and she was how far from her due date about? Do you remember? He, he was 33 weeks. In 33. Okay. I, I was, I was so, like, I remember yeah. somewhere around there. So Malachi, um, he was born of emergency C-section after, you know, they try to uh, resuscitate his mom, Demi. Um, kind of had complications. He was already kind of having little seizures and trouble breathing. So um, oh. they took him up to the NICU out in, at Bakersfield, um, which is where I live. And um, you know, try to get him on oxygen or got him on oxygen, gave him everything, you know, their, mm -hmm. their protocol or whatever. And, um, they didn't have the right resources that we needed in our, in our hospital. So we had to get mm -hmm. a medevac helicopter out to Fresno, uh, Madero, which is about two hours and some change away. Um, but about time I, um, got over to Madeira. I got a phone call from the doctor and he pretty much said that there was no uh, brain activity or anything like that um, since the time that he was being monitored over there. So um, when I got there, I got to spend some time with him and um, got to pray over him with, with mm -hmm. um, some pastors and family and then uh, got to change his diaper. And then after that, mm -hmm. uh, that's when I decided to, to take him off of the machine and, and held him into my arms until he took his last breath. How, wow. How did you make that decision? Um, Cause that's not an easy decision to make for anyone with any family members. I think for me, I know I wouldn't have wanted to be Mm -hmm. you know, living like that in a sense and just from the brain trauma I'm sure that he experienced from the lack of oxygen and everything like that and the doctors mm -hmm. really having the time of of them monitoring his brain activity and then being nothing even with them trying to stimulate him and everything like that it just I think was the right thing to do um I think if I would have tried to hang on a little bit more it would almost been kind of torturing myself at that point I think Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, um, help us with the timeline. Demi had already passed at this point, or she they were she was still being cared for. Yeah, she had already passed at this time. So while so in my heart, I believe that Demi had passed at the house when I was giving her CPR. Um, mm -hmm. But when we arrived at the hospital, that's when they were trying to resuscitate her, and I think that's when they pronounced her um the okay. seat and then um I was up with Malachi for the rest of the time so okay. I was I got the chance to say bye to her one more time before I left to go be with Malachi for the rest and then from there I was in the mm -hmm. NICU and then from the NICU went went home to grab some clothes and then went straight to uh, Madeira because I thought I was going to be able to you know mm -hmm. my son but when I went there that's on the way over that's when they told me it wasn't looking good okay okay um Thank you for sharing that story because I I can't imagine how hard it is to relive it. But I believe that every time you share that story that you're healing or helping someone else. Um, after you received the news of losing both um, in, in what seemed like a completely normal pregnancy, everything was going well. There was no red flags. There was no warning. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, everything changed. Um, and before you know it, uh, you're faced with the loss of, um, having even a day with your, with your newborn, what did grieving look like for you? Uh, grieving for me was a lot of eating, uh, drinking. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was survivor's guilt, always thinking that I could have did something more mm -hmm. or something that I didn't catch or anything like that. Um, I suffered, That's interesting. I suffered some memory loss, um, just like nothing too crazy, but it was kind of scary forgetting like my own birthday, like simple thing where my keys were, where I, where I put them, like little things like that. 
Um, how did you real? How did you realize that? Did someone bring that to your attention, or did you realize yeah. for yourself that that you were losing your memory? Yeah. Um, at first, it was just kind of a joke, and then mm -hmm. um, I think one of my family members had mentioned it, and I was just like, "I'm always forgetting my keys now." All of a sudden, so that's mm -hmm. when it kind of became a reality. And then um, just as time went on, just having certain conversations and stuff like that, that's when mm -hmm. I, somebody pointed out that I had got my birthday wrong and how old I was um so that was pretty interesting um, yeah it's interesting how trauma affects the brain right <laughs> did you ever have flashbacks about because you actually performed cpr and demi did you ever replay that in your mind uh yeah i definitely had flashbacks um flashbacks of of the cpr um flashbacks mm. of when i first got to see malachi him you know first thing was he shaking that was the first time i seen my son the mm -hmm. flashbacks of not everything but a lot of the heavy stuff for sure and then i also have triggers now sometimes not they're not as bad as mm -hmm. they were before but when i would drive by the hospital or you know hear sirens for uh, some time after that i would kind of get triggered or um just places that i would go with demi and hang out you know that was those are right. all triggers too so yeah yeah and how how did you heal through it or are you still healing where are you in the process um i feel like i feel like you're always healing from something like this because you never you never forget it you know um and mm -hmm. i think it's something that you shouldn't forget so um i definitely feel like i've come a long way so from when i first started and that's with the help of a lot of prayer and and church and family um mm -hmm. I was fighting it for, for about a year, year and a half, but um, grief counseling was actually very helpful because it helped me feel, it learned the emotions that I was experiencing and putting words mm -hmm. to the emotions I was experiencing, I should say, and it helped me feel normal. Um, doing videos and, and doing some of the exercises to actually really sit and take inventory of what's going on in my mind and putting mm -hmm. it, that was really helpful. How did you end up in grief counseling? Was it something that you, because a lot of people don't even think of grief counseling as an option. Um, was it something you were aware of someone brought to your attention? It was, it was uh, Tracy um, and I was dragging my feet. I could tell you, I was, mm -hmm. I did not want to do it. I was like, I don't need to do that. Blah, 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 blah. Typical go to counselor, you know, counseling uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I heard it from her and um, like a family friend of mine actually um, was teaching the course or he had just got done teaching the course, but, um, he offered to do a private one-on-one -on -one session with me. So I really was blessed with that and was able to do it with him. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And you have, as a result of the medical malpractice, um, with both Malachi and with, um, Demi, you've become this amazing advocate. Why become an advocate? Why fight? Um, I think, first of all, thank you. I don't think I'm a great advocate, but I'm out here swinging. Well, I've seen you guys talk. I know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I think for me, I think you kind of get chosen to advocate. Um, just mm. from the severity of how I lost my family and how it shouldn't happen at all. Um, but the way it happened, I think um, I honestly wouldn't be able to to live with myself if I didn't fight for my family. Um, and with that, you know, as I got older came perspective, you know, because I obviously experienced the one in a million kind of experience of birth, you know, mm -hmm. um, the advocacy work that you guys are doing, what is the focus? Like what, what is your goal? What do you hope to accomplish? Uh, we hope to accomplish to really spread awareness to, to moms about, you know, obviously preeclampsia because that's what is what got my family. So uh, mm -hmm. preeclampsia, just trying to provide them with resources to help them with their pregnancy any way we can, or um, even if it isn't a resource, maybe just point them in the right direction of education for their pregnancy of what to look for, um, maybe how to obviously prepare for your baby and things like that. Um, we try to give out blood pressure machines. Um, and really our ultimate goal mm -hmm. is just to, to protect families. Um, by educating in, in any way we can really, just because no family should have to go through what I went through. Um, I don't wish it upon anybody.
And you're living in a city that has an interesting history when it comes to maternal mortality. Tell us more about what the experience in Bakersfield is like. Um, Bakersfield, ever since everything happened to me, I think that's when my eyes opened up about how, how much more people, um, don't know that they can kind of shop around for doctors and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. so I think there's definitely a, I hate to say it, but a lack of education, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to things like that, being able to switch a doctor or feeling like you can't kind of, you know, shop around for doctors, um, But then on the other hand, you have, you know, just like every community, you have everything that runs the way it should too, you know what I mean? So um, I feel like for for the community, I feel like it's a great community. It's a, it's a sm small feeling community, we always say, but it's a big, kind of a big city feel. So you kind mm -hmm. of get the both worlds here. And you're in an interesting fight on behalf of Malachi as well. And I think something that you've even brought my attention to you that I had not paid attention um, to, because oftentimes the maternal mortality um, focus has been the mom um, and not a lot of attention is paid to infant mortality. Um, but you have an interesting challenge when it comes to Malachi. Can you explain what's going on in that? Yeah, so um, I obviously can't get too much into the to the crazy mm -hmm. details, but... Um, mm -hmm. They're referring my son um, in the paperwork and the documentation and things like that as a fetus. Um, and that's not the case at all. I, I got to hold my son. I have pictures of my son. Um, I seen my son, even though he was struggling to breathe, you know, he was breathing. He was alive. So he definitely wasn't a fetus. Um, so in California, there's a statute of limitations um, for all minors to be able to fight um through the boards for, for, for closure and justice for their family. So that's what I'm trying to do with my son. Um, but they keep denying it and referring to him mm -hmm. as needed. So. Thanks for raising our, uh, our attention to that. Cause I think, you know, um, sometimes we use all these medical jargons and we don't really pay attention to how the medical jargon then translate into the legal, uh, legal terminology and civil rights and, and your ability to, um, have justice or to obtain justice. Um, so, so thank you for raising awareness of the terminology and how it potentially can have these types of outcomes um, and make things more challenging for families who are trying to obtain justice for their loved ones. It's been since 2019. Did I get that right? For other fathers out there who are just getting that pregnancy test like you did and see that the pregnancy test from CVS is positive, um, what would you advise or what would you share would be something that they should do? How can they become more involved in the pregnancy experience and uh, prepare for fatherhood? Uh, the first thing I would say is uh, take a breath, relax, and, and, and just enjoy the moment. Um Another like thing that. I'd say was um, educate yourself, you know, whether it be little by little, learning the trimesters as you go, you know, first, second, or third. Um, make it fun with, with her. Download the app, the baby app, to track the baby with her and kind of engage in conversation like that. Now, that's interesting. I haven't had dads download that app, but yeah. you're right. <laughs> I, uh, I like, I'm, I'm going to actually share this with my patients. To have their partners, because I'm always trying to share ways that their partners and uh, fathers can be more involved in the pregnancy. But I've never actually thought about the dads downloading the apps. Mm -hmm. I'm, then, I'm stealing that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to remember how, she, uh, remember to ask how she's feeling and how her day went, you know, little things. Mm -hmm. um, I would say try to show up to every appointment that you can and take notes. Um, now what I... What I tell people to do is to take notes. Um, even if you do a voice memo, if you feel like you can't take good notes, just take a voice memo of everything and go back and, and you know, take notes of it like that. Um, another thing. That's I would so say, good. That's so good. I tell my patients to do that too. Because, you know, sometimes mom brain, you forget a 
things here and there as the brain prepares for motherhood. Um, so I, I love that. I love the taking notes just so also you can kind of process because right. oftentimes right. you go into the office and we're spewing off. We got 10 minutes, 15 minutes to spew off. This is happening. That's happening. And this is happening. And it's a good way to kind of refresh yourself about what was discussed and realize questions that you may have uh, for the next visit or for a message to be sent to the physician. So I, I completely agree with you on that. Uh, lighten the load, you know, start taking care of some of the chores a little bit more around the house. Um I love, listen, I'm a co-sign that one. (laughs) 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 Including in the postpartum period, I'm going to co-sign that because, yeah, because, yeah, your mom is, oh, I love the symbolism of it, right? The fact that you said lighten the load because she's carrying the weight of the pregnancy, right? Mm. And then it's an opportunity for dads to carry the weight of the household. Mm. Oh, I love that. (laughs) There you go. You made it even better. (laughs) <laughs> I love, listen, I'm just vibing with what you're saying. I love that. And then um, lastly, I would say, and probably one of the more important things is to um, just kind of really have an open ear of, because sometimes they, you know, they'll just kind of vent to how they're feeling out loud and talk to themselves out loud. So sometimes they might not say it in the doctor's office because they're either shy or timid or they feel like the doctor's scary. So at that mm-hmm. point, you kind of have that note okay, she was feeling like this. So let me let me kind of step up to the plate for both of us and ask. Um, I feel like that's very powerful too because a lot of people are shy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I feel like this is a place where it should be a safe place to where no question is a dumb question and, and you should ask. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. And the white coat intimidates people. And listen, it intimidates kids. The kids see you come in with the white coat and they're like, oh no, I know who you are. (laughs) Yeah, the white coat can be definitely very intimidating. Um, And and I'm going to piggyback with what you just said in terms of um, being able to be that voice for your partner. Um, Also, just even in terms of moms who struggle with mental health, I found that to be also uh, a a support system for moms who, when you're struggling with depression or anxiety, sometimes people are not verbal. You know, they don't, they communicate less, they isolate. And so it's really helpful even before moms deliver, I oftentimes will, um, especially if they have a history of having a mood disorder, will come up with a plan. And I say to them, hey, your safety partner is your partner. Can you give them permission to contact me on your behalf um, if, if they see that things are changing or something's happening that they're concerned with? So also just even giving permission to the father to who may be seeing red flags and may have concerns to contact the clinician on your behalf is also um, is also, I think, a, a huge support for moms. Um, so I like that you're sharing for dads to be proactive about that. Mm-hmm. That's gonna save some lives. I like that. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. So so um, no, believe me, it is. It's definitely gonna save some some lives because those those tips, like the um, the uh, the campaign that the CDC started um, through the HHS, which is Hear Her. Part of that Hear Her campaign is to in is to really encourage family members fathers to be actively involved in pregnancy and to be able to be observant, to listen to her, and then also be a conduit to the medical system on behalf of moms who may be more intimidated, like you said, or more, um, or doesn't, don't necessarily feel comfortable having certain conversations. Um, so I definitely think us in conjunction with other organizations that are spreading the same message, I absolutely believe it's going to be life-saving. I absolutely believe it because families see stuff that I don't get to see in 10 to 15 minutes in the office, right? Mm-hmm. Like you guys are taking those notes, seeing the whole behavior, seeing signs, seeing symptoms that I may never see. And when moms come into the office, they may forget to share those symptoms or may not be as self-aware. Um, mm-hmm. So I appreciate that. How does What does life look like moving forward? You know, do you have aspirations to be a dad again? What do are you open to those dreams? Like, where are you in that journey? Um, so life after everything, um, as far as aspirations to be a dad, I think I was 
that was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, I, I knew in my heart, I kind of, I wanted to do, you know, fatherhood again, but at that point in time, especially so fresh, I was just like, get everything away from me. Um, for me, it was really a start over, um, moved back in with my parents. Um, I got let go from my job. I was doing tire technician. So, um, Mm being under the cars and heavy equipment, it just wasn't a good thing, especially with the way my mind was with, you know, memory loss and all of that stuff. So, um, and at that point I just kind of had a career change and went to barber school. Um, Mm -hmm. and that really helped me too. um, just getting out the house and being around people and trying to be somewhat normal, but being young and going through something like that, it was very unique because I, on one end of the spectrum, I gained a new community I can relate with, whether it be widows and, um, you know, people that have experienced loss with, with, um, children. So I gained a community there, but then on the other end with the younger side, it just felt like I got farther away from everybody because I felt like I was, um, I feel like I was an outcast because I, I, a lot of people that I was around, I knew they knew my story and it just felt like, oh, there, there's that guy like that. That's the guy mm. that happened to, or, or here, that's him. Like, yeah. I know that sounds like such a big head thing, but it's just what I personally. Oh no, I totally get that because you become, because it's such a unique experience and such a one in a million, like you said, mm-hmm. that in a way it does kind of label you. Right. So it almost looks like, oh, I had the ick or something. Like, I don't know. Yeah. That's yeah. Work. Um, and then it was it was hard. Um, it was hard dealing with all those emotions, trying to work mm-hmm. through them. Um and learning I learning the new normal. Learning I literally became a new person when everything happened. Um it was mm-hmm. like the old me died and a new one was born again. Um because I lost interest in some of the things that I really liked to do back then. And um, during that time, I didn't even want to deal with anything. Um, so it was, it was tough. It was tough. Mm-hmm. It didn't feel like yeah. I belonged anywhere at some points in time, but um, yeah. And what about where are you now? So I'm officially a barber now. Um, I'm married. Um, ah, so, I yeah. didn't even know that. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Congratulations! Yeah. Thank, you, thank you. I just got married in September, so not even a oh, year. You just got married. You're newlywed. Yeah, I'm still. Oh a my god! Now I got <laughs> so many more questions, but I'm not gonna keep you all night. <laughs> that is one. So how? Oh, I got it. I got to ask you no one worries, question. No how did you get? How did your healing get there? I would say. To simple is time. Time really got me there. Um, and a lot of talking to God, man, a lot of it, a lot of prayer. I feel like it was really confusing trying to figure out my story. Um, as far as you hear so many different things, you're young, you're, you're supposed to date. Um, and then you mm-hmm. kind of have the older mindset too of like, nope, that's it. Like you're not supposed to date anymore. Kind of like, you know, mm-hmm. your grandma, grandpa, like they don't remarry. So like, it was right. a real hybrid mindset of of things like that, especially from from just talking to other people, and uh-huh. it was very confusing. Um, like I said, you had people telling you this, and you had people telling you that, so it was very. There's a lot right. of noise. so it really was just time and talking to God and and really trying to get myself centered and ask myself what I wanted in my life and what mm-hmm. what I wanted in my life and not what anybody else wanted in my life. Um, but it was hard. It was really hard. Yeah, that transitions are. Wow. And, and how do you balance honoring? Now you see, I got more questions. I was going to let you go, but I'm so excited to hear this news. Okay. <laughs> I'm no so worries. excited. No to worries. hear this news. Away. Uh? I said, ask away. No worries. I was going to say like, how do you balance the honoring of Demi's memory and the honoring of your wife? Uh, well, first of all, I have an amazing wife. She is so supportive. Um, even from the get go, she when I told her my story and, and she mm-hmm. really got to learn um, from day one, she's been supportive. Um, so I feel like that's I mean, I'm very lucky and fortunate to have a supportive wife um, that likes to be. Mm-hmm. Joined. I kind of gave her the stiff arm the first couple of years. I'm not going to lie, just because I was still getting used to everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
but I would say a, a supportive wife. Um, but it's amazing. Um, That's wonderful. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. It's it's nice just because. Listen, the smile on your face <laughs> yeah, says it all. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'm just very very grateful, and um, now that I was ready to to actually have my wife there at the events, um, it just makes it even easier. Um, but before, even when she didn't attend the events and she would ask to go and I would say, no, I don't, I, I don't want you to go yet. Um, for my own reasons, um, she was still supportive. So that just to keep it simple support. And I just have an amazing, woman, so I can't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I well, we go in right there. <laughs> I love <laughs> that. I love that, and I hope to meet her at yeah, one you of will. the events. You will. I, I really do. I, I want to see this amazing woman who got that beautiful smile on your face. Okay. So Thank that's, <laughs> you. listen, if, if ever there was a way to kind of conclude this experience, um, that is, that is really the hope, right? You go through these experiences, you heal from them and then life continues and you continue to be light. Right. Mm hmm mm Um, hmm so, so I'm, I'm ex so excited for you and I'm just so honored for your transparency. I mean, you and Tracy are just amazing in, not just how, what you share in terms of what you learn, but just how you share your soul um, and, and are so transparent with these conversations. And I think even through the hurt, the pain, you guys have found an amazing purpose. Um, and it's, it's truly to be in the fight with y'all because y'all don't quit, <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> y'all do not quit. So if there was ever take a final take home message for everyone, what would you want the public to know? No. <laughs> I would say in general, get get close to God. That's what I would say, first of all. Um, but for fathers, I would say just really try to relax and, and it's not and have the mentality of it's not about you anymore. Now it's really not about you anymore. Just kind of have that servant mentality um, always going on. um because she's taking care of your baby you know what i mean she's doing all of the work she you don't know how she's feeling um and i'm sure you don't want to know how she's feeling so um Mm -hmm. do everything you can to like i said um lighten the load for her um love on them and and just enjoy the moments you know because i'm an example you never know when that stuff can be taken away so um day by day just be present with your you and your family and and live life. Mm. I love that. I love that. I really love that. I love the underlying message of fathers out there, get close to the father. Okay. Mm hmm <laughs> I love it. Love Yeah. it. Mm Xavier, you are amazing. If people wanted to follow your journey or to continue to get more information about Save a Mom, Save a Family, how can they reach out to you? -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so our handle for Instagram is at Save a Mom, Save a Family Foundation. And then my personal is um, at Zavi underscore. And then um, if you want to check out my barber page, my barber page is at Zavi underscore blends with the S. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Love it. And we will have that information below also um, so that you guys will be able to reach out to Xavier. Um, I am Dr. T, the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump Club right here on YouTube and Healthy Bump dot club on Instagram. We thank you guys for watching. If you want to find out more about Demi's journey and Demi's story, you can also check out Demi's mom's experience um, of losing her daughter and losing her grandson. Uh, we thank this family for, for sharing their experience with us as we learn so much about motherhood, advocacy, and the healing process after loss. Thanks again for watching this episode and we see you guys when the next episode.